Hi, I'm Bert Jacobson, Dean for Environmental and Institutional Sustainability here at Kankakee Community College, and I'd like to welcome you to our first course in Sustainable Resource Management. I'd like to begin this course with a little introduction of sustainable resource management within the context of sustainability. This first course in a two course sequence provides an introduction to sustainable resource management within the context of sustainability. Basic principles and practices of sustainable resource management will be examined from both historical and contemporary perspectives. Students will compare and contrast various disposal options and will, con and will consider the role of government in sustainable resource management. Markets for the highest and best use of recoverable products will be examined and evaluated. And students will be introduced to various careers in sustainable resource management. Before we start, I think it's important to set the context for sustainable resource management squarely within an understanding of sustainability. The transition from an exploitive business plan for the planet to a sustainable one has roots in the first federal air quality protection laws of the 1950s. But it wasn't until after the Brundtland Commission report in the 1980s that the term sustainability began creeping into our lexicon. The Brundtland Commission concluded that traditional economic development was making all of the worldwide problems worse. Problems of environmental pollution, degradation and destruction, hunger, poverty, public health, the social, economic, and political structure, and human rights. They called for a new kind of development, sustainable development, where meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs was, was the marching mantra. This is the triple bottom line, a depiction of the three components of sustainability. It says that it is possible to create a thriving economy while maintaining a flourishing environment and building a strong and equitable society. But don't be confused by this illustration. A sustainable future does not only exist in the intersection of these three components. We need to take a systems view of sustainability where the economy exists within the society which exists within an environment with a myriad of interdependencies among the three. With every breath we take and with every drop of water we drink, we should be aware of the environment to which we owe our existence. This slide from Deborah Rowe articulates this awareness from a global perspective. All life supporting resources are declining and all living systems are in long term decline and declining at an accelerated rate. Living systems include oceans, fisheries, forests, grasslands, soils, coral reefs, wetlands, and so on. There are 2.7 billion people without sanitation who earn less than $2 a day. Over 1 billion people have no access to clean drinking water. Water shortages are rampant around the world and getting worse. There have been food riots on three continents because of the price of food staples, which has more than doubled in the last few years. And we see worldwide economic recession, international conflicts over oil and water, and ideology which are destabilizing world society. At the same time, the consumption of life-supporting resources is rising. We have just reached a world population of 7 billion people and are on track to reach almost 10 billion by 2050. And still, all of this is happening as 25% of the world's population is consuming 70 to 80% of the world's resources. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment is a project undertaken by over a thousand internationally recognized experts from 2001 to 2005 who assess the state of the world's major ecosystems and the consequences of human-induced changes. There is established but incomplete evidence that changes, are being the changes being made are increasing the likelihood of nonlinear changes in ecosystems, including accelerating, abrupt, and potentially irreversible changes that have important consequences for human well-being. Examples of such changes include disease emergence, abrupt alterations in water quality, 
the creation of dead zones in coastal waters, the collapse of fisheries, and shifts in regional climate. Because there are a myriad of interdependencies among these degraded and unstable, unsustainable systems, we need to look at these situations systemically and holistically. Sustainability provides that context for us. We need to reduce energy and the consumption of non-renewable materials, reuse and explore renewable resources for energy and products, recycle everything, and rethink Remember that the economy exists within the, a society, within an environment. We need to rethink everything, or as the Berkeley Ecology Center puts it, if it can't be reduced, reused, repaired, rebuilt, refurbished, refinished, resold, recycled, or composted, then it should be restricted, redesigned, or removed from production. So how did it get to this? 200 years ago, the United States was primarily an agricultural society of family farms. The world was big and the world was abundant. Over the last 200 years, through industrialization and the discovery of oil, the world has now become hot, flat, and crowded, in Freeberg's terms, um, in a book by that title. We have exploited the Earth's life-supporting resources with abandon, and our unsustainable approach has brought us to this. Meanwhile, our disregard for protection of our air, water, and soil has brought us to a point where our unsustainable use of these life-supporting resources has brought us to a critical point. Our business as usual in 2012 ignores the fact that we are close to exceeding the carrying capacity of the planet. We must either learn to live sustainably and do it quickly or face a very new type of existence and possibly no existence at all. A major contributor to our environmental problems associated with air and water quality is our creation and handling of waste. Waste, or specifically solid waste, refers to any garbage or refuge, sludge from water treatment plants, water supply treatment plants, air pollution control facilities, and other discarded materials including solid, semi-solid, liquid, or gaseous materials resulting from industrial, commercial, agricultural, and community activities. In general, there are two types of solid waste, non-hazardous and hazardous. Non-hazardous waste consists of trash or garbage generated by residential households, offices, and other sources. Generally, this material is classified as municipal solid waste, or MSW. Industrial solid waste consists of non-hazardous non materials that result from the production of products by various industries. Municipal and industrial solid waste are what fills the landfills. And many components of this non-hazardous waste have the potential for reuse and recycling. Hazardous waste consists of materials that are dangerous or potentially harmful to human health and the environment. These materials can ignite or explode, corrode, or induce harmful or fatal effects when they are ingested, absorbed, or inhaled. Nuclear and radioactive waste creates health and environmental hazards that can per persist for hundreds or thousands of years. Medical waste consists of materials that are contaminated with infectious agents or blood. An enormous and ever-increasing quantity of waste are generated and disposed of annually. Worldwide industries generate, generate and dispose of over 7.6 billion tons of industrial solid waste each year. 40 million tons are hazardous materials. Nuclear and medical hazardous waste are also increasing every year. In the United States, 243 million tons of municipal solid waste is generated every year, which is equal to 4.3 pounds of waste per person per day. 34% of that 243 million tons is recovered and recycled or composted, 12% is incinerated, and 54% is landfilled. The goal of zero waste is to recover, recycle, or compost 100%. San Francisco currently diverts 75% of their MSW from landfills, and Chicago is around 30%. 
In the meantime, we have to deal with this waste. In this course, we will be identifying the fundamental principles and practices related to waste reduction and reuse, recycling and marketing commodities and composting of organics, and the recovery of other materials. Sustainable resource management is one way we can deal with the waste and also begin to rethink the way we do things. Just as a way of an example of how sustainable resource management contributes to a sustainable future, let's look at the zero waste idea a little more closely. In zero waste, the least favorable and least difficult way to deal with waste, and the most unsustainable, is the conventional way we, we are used to disposal. Recycling, beneficial disposal like composting or energy recovery, and non-beneficial disposal putting it in a landfill or burning it. As we move towards sustainability and zero waste, zero landfill, we eliminate non-beneficial disposal and add to our recycling and beneficial disposal methods with redoubled efforts to eliminate, reduce, and reuse materials. The most favorable, most difficult, and most sustainable approach is to eliminate waste by redesigning materials in the first place so that they can be reused or recycled or as William McDonough and Michael Brangart have written, all products can be designed for continuous recovery and re reutilization and reutilization as biological or technical nutrients, eliminating the concept of waste. The two courses in this Sustainable Resource Management Certificate program will prepare you to Explain the resource management system with command of the technical language and the tools employed to eliminate waste, reuse products and packaging and using resources effectively. Analyze markets and service opportunities for reusables, repurposing, recoverables, recyclables and compostables for a variety of resources. Develop and conduct evaluations or surveys of materials and business practices to consider how companies could change practices to reduce waste generation. Demonstrate sound management practices, the applicable resource management laws, regulations, policies, economically sound business practices, health and safety regulations, and incorporate best practices into their everyday resource management work work. Develop an effective outreach campaign strategy aimed at increasing public awareness of and participation in sustainable resource management, utilizing social media and community-based marketing in addition to face-to-face -face marketing tools, and identify the types of careers associated with resource management, including the skill sets required for entry-level positions. I hope this has been helpful and I hope you enjoy the course.